It is my honor to introduce Father Tony Ricard. Thirteen years ago, a young guy walked into this major event called the Los Angeles Religious Education Congress, having no idea what he was getting himself into. Little could he have known where God would take him. Little could he have known the power and magnitude of such a great event. And of course, little could the Congress people know what was about to hit them. I can tell you, my brothers and sisters, every year that I get a chance to come out and to be with you, truly, it is one of the most powerful moments in my life. Often I pray that other priests could get a chance to experience what I experienced. I wish that some of the young seminarians could have a chance to know the power of God and what happens when you bring your whole self to the table. Because indeed we know God is good. Yes, indeed. Woo! Lord, 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 what y'all done done up in here? I can tell you that it's always a blessing to have a chance to come and to share the gift that God has given me with you, to, to be able to share the love of our God and the love of our family. Because I, I know that sometimes people think, oh my God, it's Father Tony. And I don't blame you. Because I, I know if I wasn't me, I'd want to be. But I, I can tell you that a lot of times I, I get so blown away at the magnitude and power that comes when you're truly where God needs you to be. You know, for me, being here, it's kind of like when mama has her baby and holds him for the first time. For me, being here gives me those moments when you know this is exactly where God needs you to be. And so I thank y'all as always for being my West Coast clique, for being my people, so that wherever I go, I know somebody got my back. Well, y'all need to know that today, uh, I'm, I'm just thanking God for the gift of the internet. Because as I celebrate with you the gift of our blessed mother, right now there's a little lady who's near and dear to my heart that's watching us over the internet. My mama is sitting in front of the computer right now, looking at her baby. And you know, I gotta tell you that this past year has been kinda tough in our family. Any of you who follow me on Facebook or get messages will know that my mom has been having a really, really tough year. About a month and a half ago, ago, we didn't even know if she was going to be with us much longer. And so the fact that she's home, doing well with my sister-in-law, Annette, who's taking care of her, it, it really is a blessing. And, you know, whenever I go out and I talk about the Blessed Mother, I always, you know, hope that I could bring my mama with me. 
You know, we did something on the Blessed Mother about 10 years ago, and she came to the conference. And I'll never forget, she was sitting down in the front, and I told her, you know, I said, you know, come on, Mom, and then at the end, I'm going to bring you up to talk to the people. Because, you know, everybody wants to know what's it like to be Father Tony's mother. <laughs> I mean, I know she had my sister and my brother first, but truly God blessed her with me. I know it. I know it. And so, so you know, and I'll never forget, we were in a room with about 3,000 people. But when she came in, there were only like 100 people in the room. And so when I brought her up on the stage at the end, she hadn't realized that the whole room had filled up since she got there. And all I'm going to say is, I cannot repeat the word that came out of her mouth. When she walked up and turned, it was like, oh, and then you know what finishes that. And everybody in the room heard it, including the people that were recording it for the CDs. And all I said, that's my mama. <laughs> so, you know, so what I want to do right now is ask the Congress to do something personal for me. I ask you that you lift my mama up in your prayers to help keep her strong on this journey. And since we're dedicating this conference to the gift of our Blessed Mother, what I want y'all to do right now is to join me in prayer and ask the Blessed Mother to tell her baby to take care of this baby's mama. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and to the hour of our death, amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Mama, that was for you. But I'm not finished yet. Kevin, come on up, come up, come up. Because y'all know my mama's some proud of her baby. In fact, she just had my sister-in-law send a text that said, look how many people there to see my baby. So I need to take some pictures. So y'all give my brother a hand, give my brother a hand. <laughs> and so, so look, I need to take a couple pictures for my mama. So could y'all get together? All right, all right, well, I'm going to get this section over here. All right, well, you got to get this section over here. Because you know, you know, your mama always want to, wait, hold on. All right, there we go, okay, good job, good job. Yes, indeed, because that's for my mama. I got to bring that home to her. Thank you, sir, thank you. You know, it, it really is a, a blessing, and I can tell you that, that, Often, when I, when I do what I do, it's such a joy to, to be able to go out and to celebrate the love of God. And, and I know that, that a lot of times people, they, they get caught up in the moment. And, you know, I know when y'all come to hear me, y'all expect to have a good time. You know we're going to laugh about something or somebody, but you know we're going to have some fun. And it, it really is a blessing. And part of why I am who I am is because I come from such a loving family. I come from a family where, where we celebrate who we are and we always have a good time. And in fact, you know, my brother, my sister and I, as you can guess, we're all real talkative. And we used to think my daddy was quiet. We found out that between my brother, my sister, my mama and me, the man never had a chance to talk at all. <laughs> so we thought he was quiet. Come to find out he wasn't quiet. So once we got older, now he talks all the time. We're like, dude, where did this man come from? <laughs> but it's because we love being together. In fact, our family is usually together on Sundays. You know, we love having just a good time being with each other. And so part of how we are who we are, we know it's because of, of where we come from and the people we belong to. Well, you know, the other day. <laughs> yeah, I know, y'all know, y'all. The other day. <laughs> There was a little boy walking through the department store with his mama. And as he walked through the store, he looked up and he noticed this big red bike. And he's like, mama, 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 I really want that bike. And she says, you know, baby, we really can't afford that bike. So he was a little disappointed, but what he decided he would do is he would go home and pray for the bike. 
So I, he went to his room and he knelt down by his bed and he said, Lord, I really want that bike. And I'll give you 24 hours to get it to me. <laughs> well, after 24 hours passed, would you believe, right there in the living room, to that little boy's surprise, no bike. <laughs> well, he thought, you know, maybe something was wrong with his prayer. So he went back to the room and he knelt down and he was like, Lord, I really need that bike. And I give you 24 hours to get it to me. Well, as you guessed, 24 hours passed and still no bike. Well, you know, he was really, really disappointed, and he was just crushed because he always heard that if you pray for it, you'll get it. And so he was walking around the house, you know, just all distraught, and he happened to pass through his grandmama's room. And there on her dresser, like all good grandmamas, was her altar. She had her statue of St. Jude, the Blessed Mother. She had St. Joseph. She had candles burning to everybody you can imagine, you know. And so he looked up, and when he saw the statue of the Blessed Mother, it was so beautiful that he took it down and he brought it to his room. He laid it on the bed. Then he wrapped it in the towel and he stuffed it in the bottom drawer and he said, Lord, if you ever want to see your mother again, get me my bike. <laughs> well, needless to say, I never did get that bike. <laughs> I don't make them up. I just repeat them. Because <laughs> the other day, <laughs> you know, my, one of my favorite stories about Our Lady Starved to See Catholic Church in New Orleans is the fact that one thing you're going to get in my church is some Catholic people. We like super Catholic in New Orleans. You know, when you come in our church, you know you're Catholic. We have such a good time, and we do it in such a unique flavor. You know, we have a 45-piece gospel choir at our church. Talk about an awesome experience. You, you know, we go to Mass at 10, we get out about noon, unless the Saints play, and then we out for 11.30. But still, <laughs> like, we have so much fun at church. At our church, we got to make people leave after Mass. We don't have none of them quarterback sneak ones. You know, the ones try to get out after communion, or they get their quarterback. You know, them ones. We don't want them. But like, like our church loved being there. And I remember before Katrina, we, uh, would, people would come to Mass, you know, regular, but, but we had an 8 o'clock morning Mass. And we had this one old lady who always came to Mass, but she always would come early to start her rosary. Because, you know, you ain't Catholic if you ain't got some old lady working on bees in the Mass time. <laughs> so she would definitely come early, but like the Mass is at 8, she would come at 6.30 to start our rosary. Now, unlike some of them high rootin' tootin' churches y'all got, we didn't have nobody hired to come open up the church. We ain't have no sacristans, we ain't had none of them. So that meant the priest had to open the church. So if she came at 6.30, that means I had to get up and open the church. And I'll never forget, you know, if I wasn't at the church at 6.30 to open the door, she was at the rectory ringing the doorbell. Talk about father, the church not open yet. Like, I don't know that. <laughs> and so, so, you know, I'd open it up and stuff. And I'm thinking, why you got to be there at 6.30? Mass ain't till 8. Jesus can hear you at 7.30. You know, I was like, <laughs> pretend you are on Pacific time. Come two hours later. You know, it's all right. <laughs> but no, she had to be there. And so, you know, she began there. She had to work them beads all the time. Well, one time, you know, she came early for the vigil mass, and we had an artist that was on scaffolding about 70 feet in the air working on the center dome lights. And while he was up in the air working on the lights, the old lady came in, and, you know, she went to her pew, and she knelt down, and she started to pray. You know, she just started knocking out them Hail Marys. And right in the middle of her prayer, the artist decided he'd mess with her. <laughs> so he leaned down, and he said, Hello down there. <laughs> no lady, she looked up, but she ain't see anybody. So he leaned down again, and he was like, hello down there. And no lady, she looked up, but she ain't see anybody. So he thought he'd really get her. 
So he leaned down and said, it's me, Jesus. <laughs> and the old lady looked up and said, hush up, I'm talking to your mama. I don't make them up, I just repeat them. <laughs> Cause the other day, <laughs> now this is a true story, true story. You know, during the season of Lent, you got people, you know, now's a good time to go to confession. Cause y'all know y'all got to get ready for Easter. You gotta make sure that everything is set. And I, I never forget like, you know, when the sacrament of penance is always so cool. Cause for priests, second only to standing at the altar, it's got to be one of the most humbling and most powerful moments in our lives. To have a chance to literally hear the confessions of our people and to let them know that through the assurance of absolution, not only have you been forgiven, but your soul has been cleansed to, to a point where it's returned to the moment you were baptized. That's how powerful it is. So I love hearing confessions. I, I just love it. And so I remember one time I was hearing first confession. Oh, Lord, now y'all know you can hear some stuff. Because, like, the, you know, they, they just be coming in there. Y'all know at least half this crowd could, you committed adultery, all kinds of, they're like, I needed something from the list. Like in second grade, you're like, get out of here. And so, so, like, I remember one time I was hearing first confessions, and one little boy came in, he was like, bless me four to five sins. I said, all right, what are your sins? He said, I hit my sister, I kicked the dog, then he had this panic look on his face. He was like really, really scared. I'm like, man, what's the matter? What's wrong? What's wrong? He said, sister say we're supposed to have three. You want me to go out and come back? <laughs> I'm like, no, dude, it's all right. It's all right. I'm like, he's going to go back and like, Psh, I hit my sister one more time. You know, it's like, <laughs> you're like, no, no, it's good. But like, like I never forget, you know, I was hearing confessions uh, on the first Sunday after my ordination. I was, you know, my first Sunday in the parish. I was at St. Rita's Church in uptown New Orleans. And I'll never forget the moment that, you know, I realized I had to go in that old confessional. You know, because at St. Rita's, we had the one, you know, with the little door, and you sit in the middle, and you got the little sliding doors on the side like that. And so, and, and like, I'm already scared. I'm scared of the dark. I don't like to be in no little close combined areas. So like, like I'm in the room already. I'm, I sit down. And then the hardest part for the priest is stuff will be going on outside the confessional. But because you're in the confessional, you can't look. <laughs> you hear people passing by. Of course, you also hear people talking about, I can't stand that Father Tony. I don't like you either. And so it's all right. <laughs> you know, so, because y'all don't know we be hearing everything. It's just a curtain. It's not like you don't think we can't. So like, but people be passing, they be doing stuff. And I'll never forget, I was hearing confessions that first Sunday I was at St. Rita's and back in the back of the church, they had these big glass doors that needed oil. So every time the door would open, it was like, ing, clunk, 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 clunk. And I remember one time I was sitting in the confessional and I heard the door open. It was like, ing, clunk, 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 clunk. And then I heard this, ching, 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 ching. Now y'all know, when you hear that music in the movie, what's going to happen? <laughs> and the only thing going through my mind is the old mafia movies. <laughs> when they go into church and shoot up the confessional. And I'm like, I can't look outside. But I'm thinking, oh, Lord Jesus. So I'm like, yeah, I'm trying to do the act of contrition myself in case I die that moment, you know. <laughs> I'm like, then I'm, I'm pulling out a mirror, you know, bless me, me, five sin. I'm trying to do what I got to do. <laughs> and luckily, I looked at my watch, and it was time to get out the confessional. Because all I heard was, and then, ching, 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 ching. And when I opened up the door, this is what I saw. Ching, ching. It's the truth. It's the truth. So I want to shout out to my people with the walkers today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> but y'all don't know what will be going through your mind when you're in them confessionals. I'm telling y'all. Because the other day, <laughs> I was in the confessional, and, <laughs> and this man came in. And as he came in, you know, he knelt down. He was like, bless me, Father, for I'm saying. I said, okay, you know, what are your sins? He said, Father... I don't know how to tell you this, 
But I worked down at the construction site. And over the last 40 years or so, I've been taking stuff home almost every day. Say, one day I would take home some lumber. Next time I would take home some nails. Next time I'd take home some pipes. Next time I'd take home some wiring. Say, Father, I don't know how to tell you, but over the last 40 years, I've built myself a very nice house. <laughs> he said, I, I don't know what to do. And I'm thinking, man, that's, that's, that's tough. Man, I mean, like 40 years, and you, you built a house from all the stuff you stole. <sighs> man, God is going to forgive you, but you know, you're going to have to do a big penance. I said, do you know how to make a novena? He said, no, Father, but if you got the plans, I got the lumber. <laughs> I don't make them up, I just repeat them. One more, one more, one more. <laughs> the other day, this is my favorite one by confession. The other day, I know I told this one last year, but I'm telling it again. The other day, there were two priests in the rectory talking to each other, Father Frank and Father Joe. And Father Joe went to Father Frank, he said, Father Frank, man, look, I'm tired of always having to be good. I'm tired of always having to be the priest. I'm tired of always having to be nice. I just wish for one day we ain't have to be the priest. We could just do like everybody else. Go out of town, town, you know, go to the casino, get drunk. Ain't nobody would know. Father Frank said, Joe, we can't do stuff like that, man. We priests. We priests. You know, if people see us at the casino, what that would do to them? If we got drunk in public, what that would do to them? Say, man, we can't do that. We the priests. Joe said, man, that's all right, because I got a plan. We ain't going to do it here. We going to jump on that little commuter plane and go over to Vegas. And when we get to Vegas, whoo, we're going to cut up. We're going to do everything we always wanted to do, and nobody going to know. So Father Frank said, well, man, if you think that'll work. So the next day, they got on the little plane, and they flew over to Vegas, and man, talk about cut up. They had a good time. They was just having so much fun. You know, they went from casino to casino. They, from, they got drunk and just come, jumped back on the plane, got back home the next morning. When they got into the rectory, Father Frank said, Joe, man, I'm feeling bad. We shouldn't have never done that, man. We priests, we priests. And that man, priests ain't supposed to do that. What if our people find out? And Father Joe said, that's all right, Frank, because I got a plan. Tomorrow morning, when we get up, we're going to both go into church. You can hear my confession, I can hear your confession. We can take care of this. <laughs> Father Frank said, well, Joe, if you think that'll work. So the next morning they got up and they went into confession and, and Father Frank put on his vestment, he went inside and then came Father Joe. Father Joe came in, he said, bless me for the five sins. Father Frank said, man, what you did? He said, man, the other day, me and my priest friend, oh, we went over to Vegas Man, we went from casino to casino. We got drunk as a skunk. Man, it was crazy. Father Frank said, it's okay, because God is a forgiving God, and your sins are going to be forgiven. For your penance, maybe do like five Hail Marys, maybe give five dollars to the poor, and, you know, and know that God loves you no matter what. Father Joe said, well, thank you, Father Frank. And so Father Joe got out the confessional. He went put on his vestments, and him and Frank switched spots. And then came Father Frank. He said, bless me for, bless me for the five sin. Father Joe said, man, what you did? He said, man, the other night, me and my priest friend, whew, we went over to Vegas, man. We went from casino to casino. We got drunk as a skunk. Got back early the next day. He said, I'm feeling kind of bad. And Father Joe said, you did what? <laughs> I can't believe you, man. You're a disgrace to the priesthood. Oh, my God. He said, you know, you know what? You know, look, 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 for your penance, do 500 Hail Marys, give $500 to the poor, say a rosary on your knees going around the church, and then maybe, just maybe God will forgive you. But I'm not promising you anything. <laughs> Father Frank was like, Joe, Joe, what's the matter with you, man? He said, look, I don't care what I do on my free time, but I take my job seriously. <laughs> I don't make them up, I just repeat them. <laughs> time out, time out. We need to enjoy creation. <laughs> oh. 
You know, I've been really, really blessed through the years to do an awful lot of stuff. And I can tell you that, that and when I make that journey, a lot of times people, you know, are, are just, they, they ask, you know, how do I come up with some of the stuff that I'm going to preach about? And I can honestly tell you, I don't know. I have no idea. I've had times when I've, I've sat down at the computer and looked at the screen, and the screen looked back at me. <laughs> I'll never forget, you know, one time I was working on a, a homily for a, a reflection back at uh, uh, my parish when I was doing my internship before I was ordained a deacon. And in the midst of, of reflecting on all the kind of stuff, I was trying to figure out, you know, how can I put this together, make it work? You know, in the seminary, they taught us techniques on how to write a homily. You know, to write a homily, there's certain things you're supposed to do. So deacons and priests pay attention. There's certain things you're supposed to do. I'm just saying that on behalf of parishioners. I know y'all gonna beat me up later. I love you. All right. But, but like, they tell you that on Monday, you should read the readings for that coming Sunday. Just let it sit in your heart. Let it marinate in your spirit. On Tuesday, read some of the biblical commentaries. See what they've said about those readings. See what some of the great folk like St. Jerome may have said about those particular passages. On Wednesday, jot down your ideas. Write the stuff that's coming to your heart. What are some of the things that these readings are telling you? On Thursday, that's the day you're supposed to write it out. You know, I'm a word-for-word word preacher, so I actually write my homilies out word for word. And so, once you write it all out, then on Friday, you can practice. Then on Saturday morning, practice again, and you'll be ready for the vigil mass. Well, I was given a task by Bishop Dominic Carmen, who was an auxiliary bishop in New Orleans, who happened to have been my pastor, to preach at the 4 o'clock vigil mass. And so I was all excited, you know, because I was going to get the ch a chance to preach in front of the church for the first time. So I went through the process. On Monday, I read the readings. Beautiful stuff. Deep stuff. On Tuesday, I read the biblical commentaries. Man, some good stuff. On Wednesday, the day you're supposed to write out your ideas, I had nothing. On Thursday, the day you're supposed to write it out, still nothing. On Friday, the day you're supposed to practice, I had nothing. On Saturday morning, the day you're supposed to be practicing and being ready, I still had nothing. By 11 o'clock Saturday morning, I was in a panic. I didn't know what I was going to do. You know, because I didn't know then what you're supposed to do. When you get to Saturday, you're supposed to preach at the 4 o'clock vigil mass, and you have nothing. Now I know what to do, though. Because, you know, I've been a priest now 17 years, which means that I got at least three or four homilies on each of them readings, because I save everything I write. So now if I come up with nothing, I just pull up something from three years ago. Y'all ain't going to remember it, and I just write it again. <laughs> so, so I knew that I could work this process. But back then, I didn't know what to do. And so I remember that I, I did something that the Bible says you ain't supposed to do. I put the Lord thy God to the test. Because by about 11 o'clock that morning, I'm sweating at the computer. And I looked up to heaven and I said, Lord, all day long, I've been trying to write this homily. And nothing has come to me. All week, I've been missing. So look, today at 4 o'clock, you got a homily to give. What you going to say? <laughs> well, believe it or not, after about 10 minutes of praying, this is what came out. While waiting outside of church one day, I overheard a mother of the church turn to a boy and say, boy, 
you better get back home and do something about your hair. Because looking like that, they're not going to let you in there. And then seizing the opportunity, she looked him up and down and started to tell him how to dress while visiting this side of town. You got to straighten up your back, but bend your knees when you pray, because that's the only way you can hear what God's got to say. And you better change that shirt and shine them shoes, because all them colors you got on just makes me confused. And while I'm telling you all the stuff that you got to do, you better practice holding your Bible like this and your holy rosary too. Now, once you get all cleaned up and you can practice all you can, come on back to our church so you can be a real praying man. Well, after hearing that church mother talk and taking in all her stuff, that boy raised his hands to God and said, Lord, enough is enough. He prayed, Heavenly Father, I've done all I can do. I go to church most every Sunday, and I try to say it was true. But the folks in the church, they seem to be so worried about my looks, they done forgot about the love they read in their own holy books. They're so worried about my outside, my hair, my clothes, my skin, that they'll never, ever get to see the spirit I hold within. So, Father, I give them to you to do with what you please. And maybe while they're in there praying on bended knees, They'll think about your words, and their hearts will begin to see. Most people pay you lip service when their hearts are far from thee. And when he finished praying, that lady looked all about, and she saw that boy's mama coming, so that church mother began to shout, Girl, come get your boy and wash his hair and clean him up just right then maybe he could come to our church on a service of a Saturday night. But till he's looking better, he better not come here again because this is the house of the Lord. And not everybody's getting in. Well, that mother looked at that church lady as she blocked the church's doorway with a soft voice and tear-filled eyes. That mama began to pray. I've got shoes, you've got shoes, all of God's children got shoes to wear. When I get to heaven, gonna put on my shoes, walk all over God's heaven, heaven, heaven. Everybody talking about heaven ain't going there, heaven, heaven. Gonna walk all over God's heaven. Then she looked down at her son and she said, Jesus, let's go home. You know, over the span of the last 16 and a half, now going on 17 years, I've come to realize what a privilege we have as a church and as a people of God. And how many times in our lives we get a chance to not only nurture one another, but literally to nurture Mary's baby. You know, over the the, the many years, I've had a chance to do an awful lot of stuff. Literally, I've celebrated almost every sacrament that you can imagine. I've done, you know, the baptisms, and I've done the the first communion and the first penance. I've celebrated marriages. I've anointed the sick. I've even celebrated confirmation as a part of the Easter Vigil Mass. The only sacrament I haven't done yet is ordain somebody a priest or a deacon. You got to be a bishop to do that, so give me about two more years. And so I'm just saying. (laughs) But, But I can tell you that, you know, I really have been blessed to be able to do a lot of things. And I, I, I can tell you that I never imagined that I would get a chance to do as much as I've been doing when I walked into the seminary. If somebody would have told me that I'd be standing in arenas and talking to, to folk who are excited about their faith, I was like, no, you got to be crazy. Not me. Now, don't get me wrong. I knew I was going to be good. <laughs> I'm my mama's baby. I knew I was going to be good. But I never thought that I'd be doing what I'm doing. 
Well, you know, one of the greatest things that, that I had a chance to do actually happened a year after I was ordained. I was in the parish, and one of our deacons decided he would coordinate a pilgrimage. And he said that, you know, he was going to do a pilgrimage, and we were going to go to the Holy Land. We were going to go to Jordan, Israel, and a little excursion to Egypt. I was like, you know, that's pretty cool. I, I like that. So he called me and asked me if I'd be willing to lead the pilgrimage. Well, I told him, I said, I would love to. However, as one stipulation, the only way I'll go is if you have a spot for my mama on the trip. And he told me, he said, no, 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 no. Uh, he said, you know, we don't normally have a spot for the priest's mama. And I looked at him and I said, if I was a Baptist minister, you'd have a spot for my wife. I ain't got no wife. You bring in my mama. So needless to say, he was setting up a spot for my mama because he wanted the illustrious Father Tony to be with him on the trip. And so, so I'll never forget that, you know, I remember picking up the phone and I called my mama. And I was like, you know, and this was like April when we were starting. I said, you know, mama, where you at? She said, I'm at home. I said, um, go to your calendar. And she's like, okay. And you know, everybody got to have that calendar in the kitchen. So she went to the calendar, and she, I said, now flip up to November. And she flipped up to November. I said, now put your finger on November 5th. And she put her finger on the 5th. I said, what you doing? She's like, uh, nothing. And I said, well, do you think that uh, my nephew Corey and my daddy could do without you for uh, about two weeks? And she was like, okay, why? I said, because I want to take you to the Holy Land. And my mama's response is something I've never forgotten. She said, you know, baby, all my life, you've been working hard to help my dreams come true. But this is more than I could have ever dreamed of. Well, needless to say, me and my mama had us a good time. We had so much fun. Plus, I'm the baby, and if you spoil and you don't want to share your mama, take her to another country. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's that simple. And oh, but we went everywhere. You know, we went all over the Holy Land. You know, we went to, to you know, to, to see the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. When you walk in and, you know, you, you realize that you're about to climb up Calvary. Literally, you can put your hand in the spot where the cross was, was stood, and then you come down and you enter into the chapel of Anastasia, where they say it was built over the tomb of Christ. To be able to have that moment with my mama was phenomenal. To, to, to go along all around the Sea of Galilee, you know, to go to Tiberias and Capernaum, to, to go to all of the great spots where Jesus indeed preached, I realized that I was letting my mama indeed live not only a, a wonderful experience, but to reenact the life of the Blessed Mother. Because Mary went all over to hear her baby preach. My mama got to hear her baby preach in all them spots too. That's what it's all about when you think about that love. And so I can tell y'all that, that we had so much fun. Even when we went to Egypt. Because, you know, we went to, to the Great Pyramids. And then in Egypt, there are a couple of the pyramids you can go inside. Well, first, on the Great Pyramids, the three big ones, y'all know they have signs that say, do not stand on the pyramids. I took a picture standing on the pyramids right by the sign, but that's another story. <laughs> and, but, but, you know, you can go down into one of the pyramids, and when you go down, you got to go deep, 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 and then you get into the, the rooms and all that. And I told people, you know, I went in the pyramids, you know, pretending I was the Pharaoh. <laughs> then I realized that when Pharaoh went in, he never came back out. <laughs> I did not want to be Pharaoh anymore. But, but it really was cool. And then one of the most powerful moments was when we were at the River Jordan. And, you know, my mama, and when we were little, was the type of person who, she didn't want you to splash water in her face. So can you imagine when we at the River Jordan, you know, you can go down and you can, uh, you know, celebrate your baptism by reenacting a baptism. And, you know, you can't get baptized again, just in case y'all want to know. But, like, you can reenact it as a blessing. And, you know, my mama was the type of woman, we had them little three-foot pools in the backyard. 
And if she was in the pool with you, you had better not splash water in your face, and in her face, because if you splash water in her face, she was going to help you find Jesus <laughs> with a baptism. Because she's going to grab you, put you underneath the water, and say, you found Jesus yet? And you're like, is he in here? You know, it's like... <laughs> so, so we knew not to splash water in her face. But when we got to the river, mind you, it was November. It was chilly. And all truth be told, I know all my people wanted to go down there, but we had the deacon with us. He can go in the river with them. That's fine. Let the deacon have that moment. A good priest lets the deacon have a good moment. Because <laughs> I did not want to go in that cold water. That's why we have deacons, to do the stuff the priests don't want to do. But that's another story. <laughs> and so, so, like, my mama looked at me. She said, we're going in this water. And I'm like, you know, that's a lot of water, right? She's like, we're going in this water. So we went and changed and put on the little white robes, and we walk, you know, go down the little ramp, and we got into the water. So then I'm thinking, all right, I'm freezing already. But I said, you know, Mama, I know you don't like, you know, to go underwater and nothing like that, so why don't I just, you know, pour some water over your head? She said, oh, no. I was like, what? She said, I'm going in this water. I was like, what? She said, I'm going under this water. And I was like, wait a minute. This is not the same woman that I know. <laughs> and she said to me, she said, how many times will you ever have a chance to be in the water where our Savior was baptized? She said, I'm going under this water. And my mama went down in that water, and when she came up, she had this look on her face like, first, I just went under the water. But second, <laughs> it was this glorious look like, just thank you, Lord. And I think about that, I say, Lord, how powerful it had to have been for Jesus to have those same experiences with his mama. You know, all around Galilee, Jesus had that journey of going with his mama, doing some phenomenal stuff. But part of why I, I took my mama to the Holy Land, when I called her and she said she would go, she was like, this is more than I could dream of. And I'll never forget, I told her, I said, well, you know what? Ain't nothing too good for my mama. And I said, you know, I don't care what the world says. Because I know people think I'm my mama's boy. <laughs> I know it. But I'm not. <laughs> and we called my mama early, and she told me, I could tell y'all I'm not a mama's boy. <laughs> but I'm just very well kept. Very well kept. <laughs> and I think about, you know, part of why I understand our relationship with the Blessed Mother so much it's because I had a mama and have a mama who takes seriously her role of being mama. And, you know, I, I think about my mama and I think about Jesus. Jesus loved his mama so much. In fact, some would believe that he actually loved his mama more than I love mine, which I don't know if it's possible, but he is Jesus. <laughs> but do you know that Jesus' very last human act before he handed his spirit over to the Father, he wanted to make sure that somebody was going to take care of his mama. When Jesus hung on that cross, dying, he looked down at his mama standing there, and he turned to the beloved disciple and he said, Behold your mother. He looked at his mama and said, Behold your son. In other words, before I can hand my spirit over to the Father, I got to make sure that my mama going to be all right. And it was at that moment that Christ gave to us one of the greatest gifts ever, one of the greatest things that God the Father had ever given him. It was at that moment that Christ literally gave to the church the gift of his mama. And, you know, when you think about it, one thing we know is that Christ loved his mama so much. And, and, you know, heaven forbid we not hold her in such great esteem. Because when you, you think about our relationship with the Blessed Mother, Mary has been with us through all of the major moments of our faith, through all of the major moments in our church. 
And a lot of times, some of our Protestant brothers and sisters don't understand that indeed we can honor this phenomenal woman. They, they think that, wait a minute, you know, the Catholic Church and Mary, that's too much, that's too much. They think somehow we're trying to make Mary the fourth person of the Holy Trinity. That's not what we do. Mary is just a very proud mama who's trying to make sure everybody gets a chance to meet her baby boy. Mary is a proud mama who wants everybody to see her baby. And that's why earlier when my mama had my sister-in-law send us that text, she was like, look at all those people that are there to see my baby. It's simple. Just like my mama, Mary knew that everybody ought to at least have an eight by 10 of her baby in their house somewhere. <laughs> Which is why I don't hesitate to take pictures because every home needs that eight by 10 of me. <laughs> right on the wall with Abraham Lincoln, John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Barack for 60% of y'all, and somebody else. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody. <laughs> but, but I can tell you that, you know, it's amazing how, how Mary just wants everybody to, to truly understand. And that's why Jesus is like, dude, y'all supposed to honor my mama. She my mama. She my mama. That's why I gave it to y'all. And she became the mother, the queen of both heaven and earth, because her baby made sure that we were going to take care of her and she would take care of us. But there's no reason why people couldn't understand why we honor Mary as much as we do. Mary has been there from the very beginning of all things that related to Christ coming on this earth. You know, Mary was that first to say yes to God. As a true disciple of Christ, before Jesus was even here, Mary was already dedicating her life to the service of our Savior. When Mary said yes to that angel, she was saying, Lord, let it be done to me according to your word. I'm ready for this. Mary, when she carried Christ in her womb, we know that indeed she was that first person to touch and be touched by the Savior. And we also know she was the first one to talk to him. Now, why do we know that? Well, every woman who has had a child, every father who has walked that journey with his uh, wife or, and mother, you know and I know that almost every day, mama is talking to her baby in her womb. Almost every day, you know, they say, how you doing in there? Could you go to sleep now? Because you know that in that womb, she is already touching her baby internally, and he's touching her. Literally, Mary was the first person to get a kick out of Jesus. <laughs> and when, when you think about it, even when Mary and Elizabeth met each other at the visitation, what we, know, we know that when Mary walked up, Elizabeth looked at her and said, who am I that the mother of my Lord would visit me? When your words greeted me, the babe in my womb leapt for joy. I love that moment because, you know, John the Baptist, we know about 30 years later, was going to be the one to introduce Christ to the world. But do you know even John got excited in the womb? When he got that close to Jesus, when Mary and Elizabeth hugged, John was like, excuse me, mama, do you know who's over there? In fact, John was like, mama, 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 that's Jesus. But, but you know, Elizabeth was like, what's going on? And John was like, I'm trying to tell you, I'm trying to tell you, do you know who that is? And so, so Mary, Elizabeth was like, I don't know what he's trying to say, but girl, he's jumping around right now. <laughs> but indeed, Mary was the one who had that journey. And then, can you imagine when, when it came time for Christ to be born, and the Blessed Mother is there in the manger, and her baby's born? Now, now, now you know, we know the songs say he never said a, a, a mumbling word, he, he never cried. I bet you Mary did. I know he was Jesus, but it was still natural childbirth. Mary was like, I know you, Jesus, but you're going to get out right now. 
but to give birth to a child in a manger. But can you imagine that look on her face when she saw him that first time? That baby that had been in her for nine months, the one that she had been waiting for. Can you imagine how excited she was and how excited Joseph had to been when Jesus was born? They knew he was going to be something special because when they laid him in the manger, he already had that light on the back of his head. He was going to be powerful. <laughs> that was their baby. All the animals nodding into, you know, because that's what we see in the picture. <laughs> we want to thank St. Francis and all the Franciscans for giving us a nativity scene. And for including both the Dominicans and the Jesuits, because there's an ox and an ass in the picture. And so we want to thank <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. And so <laughs> I love you. <laughs> and what's funny is my mentor, the priest that has really helped to form who I am, is a Jesuit. God bless us. And so... <laughs> But, but, you know, you think about it, that moment had to be so powerful when both heaven and earth united in the incarnation, and Mary was there. Mary was such an instrumental part. Can you imagine Mary and, and when she took her baby home to Nazareth? You know, but before she could go home, they had to flee. Joseph couldn't take his wife to go back to where they wanted to be. Because Herod put out the word that the baby would be killed. He began to try and kill every child under the age of two, every male-born child, because he wanted to get rid of the Savior. Can you imagine what was going through Mary's heart during that flight to Egypt? Can you imagine the fear that somebody could be trying to kill my child? I know a lot of mamas go through that. We look at this world and the society and we realize how many things are out there trying to not physically but, but to spiritually kill our children. Mary on that flight to Egypt was feeling that in her heart, that they're trying to kill my baby. But even more, can you imagine how she had to be feeling when she realized that even though she was taking her baby to safety, back home in Jerusalem, Babies were being killed because they were trying to get her baby. Can you imagine what was going through her heart when she began to think about all the innocent ones that were losing their life? And then even in Egypt, there she was trying to do what she had to do to keep her baby safe, hoping that they could one day go back home she had to be so excited when she heard that, you know, everything was clear. Come on back. You can see Mary and Joseph heading back. When they got to Nazareth, they're like, oh, so good to be home. Elizabeth and all the kids were coming all over to say hello. It was just a powerful moment. And then Mary was there with Jesus, and Jesus was there with Mary when St. Joseph died. Can you imagine how she had to been feeling then. Here she was, uh, still a young woman. Her husband is dying. She's got a 12-year-old, a 13-year-old boy that she's got to try and find a way to help him become the man that God has called him to be. We thank God for the gift of St. Joseph because St. Joseph was the one that taught that boy how to be a man. Mary was the one that taught him how to be a person of love. Jesus had to grow up at an early age because his mama needed him to provide. So he learned the trade of his father and learned how to be a carpenter, to do what he could. And then, can you imagine when, when Mary realized that it was time for her baby to really come out in public and tell the world 
all the things they have been talking about for almost 18 years. Oh, we know publicly Jesus didn't appear until it was time for the baptism. But do you think that he and his mama hadn't been talking for 18 years about who he was and who God was calling him to be? We can only think that on those times when we don't hear from him until he's eight, uh, 30 years old, that he and his mama sat up many nights reflecting on all that God was going to need him to do. Because you see, not everybody had had the experiences that she had. Not everybody had had an angel appear and tell you exactly who this boy was going to be. So I would guess that every time she would tuck him in at night, she would let him know that God had something special for him, that he was going to be destined to usher in this great kingdom of heaven. Can you imagine what it would be like every night to put your baby to bed and tell him that God was going to call him to something great? How much better would this world be today if mothers and fathers would put their children to bed every night and remind them just how precious they are in the eyes of God. How much better would this world be? You know, in the movie Boys to Men, I'll never forget, Loris Fishburne was talking to Cuba Gooding Jr.'s character, and he said, you know, boy, you a prince, but I'm the king. And I think about that, you know, we need to tell our babies that they are destined for greatness rather than calling them all the names in the book. We need to start telling them, you are a prince, you are a princess, you are a child of God. You just, I can't imagine how much better this world would be if more babies grew up realizing who they were in the eyes of God. But Mary made sure her baby knew. Mary made sure her baby knew that he was gonna be phenomenal in this world. And then when it came time, for his coming out party. Mary didn't have to say a word because God the Father was like, girl, I got this one. <laughs> At the baptism, when he walked up, he said, baptize me, John. And John was like, wait a minute. I'm not worthy to even untie the boy's sandals. And Jesus was like, John, shut up. <laughs> to all these people here watching us. <laughs> Look, you got to baptize me because that's what you're supposed to do. And John was like, okie dokie. <laughs> and when he baptized him, the heavens opened. And we heard a voice from heaven say, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Or some translation, this is my beloved son, in whom my favor rests. Now I know that that was a powerful moment for everybody at that moment at the baptism. But I don't think that's the first time Jesus heard that. I don't think that's the first time he heard that. I think that on many times he heard his mama saying, that's my boy right there in whom I'm well pleased. So God the Father was just backing up what Mary had been telling them all those years. God the Father was just saying, boy, you know your mama, right? And Jesus began that public ministry. And we know, we know there's power in the, the, the prayers that we offer through the gift of the Blessed Mother, through her intercession. We know that there's power. We, we turn to Mary sometimes when, when we have that struggle in our life. We're like, Mary, can you help us out? And there's a reason why. Wedding feast at Cana. Mary was there and she said, you know, son, they're out of wine. And he was like, woman, what business of yours is that of mine? <laughs> now, I don't know about y'all. Let me call my mama woman one time. <laughs> then I would be downtown at the Jerusalem Dentist Clinic <laughs> trying to get some teeth put in because my mama was going to make sure I never called a woman again. <laughs> but Jesus, you know, he was Jesus, so he got away with it one time because Mary didn't even pay attention to him. She turned to the waiter and said, now do what he tells you to do. In other words, look boy, 
I've been telling you I was going to tell you what you was going to do. You're going to do this. He's like, y'all, fill up the jugs. Mama say I got to do something. <laughs> and you see, I think that that, that that was the moment because in a very real way, Jesus performed that first miracle because his mama said, baby, it's time. That's why when we offer our prayers through the intercession of the Blessed Mother, what we know is real simple. I know for me, if my mama tell me to do something, it's done. If Jesus' mama tell him to do something, it's done. That's the way it works in heaven. You know, the Blessed Mother herself does not grant miracles. Let me repeat it again. The Blessed Mother cannot create a miracle. Only the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit does miracles. But she sure can make her baby do some powerful stuff. You know, when you think about it, Mary was such a phenomenal woman, a strong woman of faith. You know, I think about when it came time for Jesus to really do what the Father needed him to do. Mary was there every step of the way. When he got that cross and was condemned to death, can you imagine what was going through his mama's heart? She knew that they said that her heart would be pierced, but she never could have imagined it would be like that. I wonder how many times on the road to Calvary did Mary catch a glimpse of her baby coming through the streets, carrying a cross, bleeding from having been whipped, suffering in front of everybody. I think about what had to been going through her mind then, those days back in the manger, her little boy growing up, playing on the pyramids, going to Nazareth, all his friends, hanging with little John. I think about all those moments that had to been going through her heart thinking, this is my baby. This is my baby boy. But I also know that she knew that God needed her to give that boy strength. And I think that moment when they, you know, in the stations when we say Jesus met his mother, I think that was that moment where Christ needed that extra boost to do what he needed to do. He had fallen again, and he got up. And I believe that when he looked up from that ground, that cross on top of him, he saw his mama standing there. And as she stood there, she looked him straight in the eye. And it was the look from his mama's eyes that gave that boy the strength to get up off that ground, to pick up that cross and to do what the father had called him to do. When his mama looked at him, she didn't have to say a single word. All she was saying was, you my baby. Don't let none of these people out here take you down. Get up off that ground. And that boy got up. And when he went up that hill, his mama following behind him. When they hung him on that tree, there she was. Do you know how hard it's got to be for a mama to stand at the foot of a cross and watch her baby die? But she stood there, a strong woman, John, the beloved, at her side. She stood there because her baby needed her to be there. She wasn't there because she was moaning and grinding and crying. She stood at that cross because her baby needed her 
to give him the strength to do what God had called him to do. It was that look from his mama that said, everything is going to be all right. You go ahead and give it over to the Father because we're going to be all right. Do what you got to do. And he said, it's finished. And he hung his head and he gave over his spirit to the Father because his mama said it would be all right. And then, can you imagine what it was like? Those three days, wondering what was going to happen to her baby. She knew in faith that he promised he was coming back. She knew that, that the father had promised her that her baby would be the savior of the world. And she probably was, was still trying to figure it all out it was the, with the confusion of the human heart to go with the spiritual heart. And I, I even think that when they were in the upper room, she was there in that upper room with the apostles because they weren't going to leave her alone. And in that upper room, it tells us that those grown men were there out of fear. They were afraid that the Jews were going to do to them what had happened to Christ. So they were all there, huddling together, shaking like little girls, not knowing what was going on. And Mary took on the role that Christ had given her. I could see the Blessed Mother standing up in that upper room, walking in the midst of those men, shivering in fear, and saying, gentlemen, get a hold of yourself. Get a hold of yourselves. Don't you remember he gave new eyes to the blind? Don't you remember that he gave new legs to the lame? Don't you remember he opened the ears of the deaf and made them be able to speak? Don't you remember when he touched the mat and the boy came back alive to take care of his mama? Don't you remember when he walked into the room with Jairus touched the little girl and said to Letha Kum and the little girl got back up. Don't you remember when he stood in front of a tomb and said, Lazarus, come forth. And the grave opened and Lazarus came back to life. Don't you remember all the things that my baby has done? This will not end in death. Get a hold of yourselves and stand strong. Get a hold of yourselves and be who you're supposed to be. And in the midst of saying, don't you remember, the door began to shake. And when Christ came through the door and all the apostles looked up in amazement, Mary looked up and said, now get out the way because my baby is back. And she ran up and she grabbed her boy. She, and Jesus didn't do that Mary Magdalene thing, do not touch me, I've not ascended to the Father. What nothing going to stop that woman from getting to her baby. And when she grabbed her boy, she said, I knew you were going to do what we needed you to do. And she turned to the apostles and said, I told you, so you better remember the next time. <laughs> you know, when we think about it, part of the role of the Blessed Mother is to help us remember. Help us to remember just exactly who God needs us to be and calls us to be as men and women of faith. Each and every one of us will have some of those tough times. Each and every one of us will have those moments in our lives when we feel like the whole world is coming down upon us. I know one of the greatest lines that I ever heard from a young boy who was talking about Father Augustus Toten, who was the first black priest in modern times. He said that the one thing that we know is that no real priest will be without his Pharisees. Everybody's got to deal with somebody who's coming after them. Everybody has trials and tribulations in their life. Everybody has pains and sorrows to deal with. But you don't have to look far to find the strength to get through it. Like the Blessed Mother, she says to us, don't you remember 
all the things that my son has already done for you. Don't you remember the power that he gives you in the Eucharist? Don't you remember the way he has come to you time and time again in taking care of some of your trials and tribulations? You don't have to look far and think about somebody else. You just need to stand up and remember. You just need to be strong in faith and know that if my baby took care of you then, he ain't going to leave you now. You're going to be all right. Just remember how he has already touched you and expect it to come again. I, I, I've talked to people and they'll come in, they'll be upset and they're like, you know, Father, we're dealing with this, we're dealing with that. And I remember one time I told a, a lady, she was like, you know, Father, we just found out that my son was diagnosed with cancer. And I said, that's not what you found out. She was like, what do you mean? You didn't find out your son was diagnosed with cancer. You found out that there's another miracle on the way. Go ahead and claim it in the name of Jesus. Just remember the power in his love. Just remember the power in his love. And I think that the Blessed Mother is saying to us, it's time for us to remember. And so we honor Mary. Why? It's simple. Can you imagine that simply through her yes to God, she indeed has given us so many great things. And you know, I always think about Mary's yes to God. She could have said no. Who would have blamed her? She was about 16 years old, being told that she was going to be an unwed mother. Because everybody knew the baby wasn't going to be for Joseph. And so Mary could have said no. I wouldn't have blamed her. Can you imagine you got to go to your mom and daddy, you know, St. Anne and St. Joel come and say, oh, by the way, I'm pregnant. Now, I know that there's some girls who try to tell you it was a miraculous birth, but we know it ain't happening like that. <laughs> but she had to face her parents. She had to face St. Joseph. Joseph knew the baby wasn't his. He and Mary were the ones that definitely knew. She could have lost Joseph, a good man. Joseph was a strong man. He was already settled in life. He had his own store, you know, Joe's Carpentry Shop. He was set. He had his own house. He probably had a two-donkey garage. The man was good. <laughs> and he was the type of man that most women look for. Because in sacred scripture, he never said another word. <laughs> so she would, could lose a good man. But she trusted God. And she said yes. That's why we honor her. I even think about like, you know, our, our, our teachings on the assumption of the Blessed Mother. I fully believe that the assumption happened the way they say it. Why? Well, it's simple. If I was Jesus and I'm up in the kingdom of heaven and I see that my mama's earthly life is about to end, I'm going to be like, look, daddy, let's do something special for mama. Instead of letting her body know decay. Can we just take her up? And I believe that the assumption, assumption happened because Jesus was telling the world, ain't nothing too good for my mama. You know, I, I can tell you that I've been really, really blessed to do what I do. And once again, I thank you for your prayers for the love over the last 13 years of this journey I've been making with Congress. And I, I can tell you that, that, you know, as you saw in the video, there, there's so many moments in my life that I look back at. I look at, you know, when I was dancing on the stage for the National Catholic Youth Conference in 2009, and oh, it was 2007, we were in Columbus, Ohio, and I was on the stage in the moment of, of standing on that stage was great, but nothing was greater than being on that stage with all my babies from New Orleans. To me, part of my call and my challenge is to make sure that like my mama did for me, that the babies in our world know that in the eyes of God, they're destined for greatness. 
That's our challenge of who we are. You know, over the last couple of years since Katrina, I've been really, really blessed to work hard to keep some of our babies in Catholic schools. And as most of you know by now, I started writing books as a direct path of keeping several young men now in Catholic schools while their parents and grandparents were trying to recover from the storm. I want to thank you that over the last six years, I've been able to donate over $100,000 to the Catholic schools of New Orleans from our book sales. And I say donate because I'm a diocesan priest. So y'all know that I didn't join the religious community because my theory was after celibacy and obedience, y'all wasn't getting the money too. That's the way it works. <laughs> but actually, you know, God blessed me so much and it, it really is a joy. And so this year, I actually have, have probably the greatest thing that I've ever done when it comes down to books. My newest book was something that I worked on with one of the boys from our Catholic high school in New Orleans. He was a 16-year-old boy who illustrated one of my most popular stories called The Eagle Story. It is really, really good. And, and so we have the books over at our booth, 714. I'm only going to mention it one time because I don't want to get in trouble. 714 is where you can come and see me. <laughs> And the books are available, and all of the proceeds go directly now to the scholarships to Catholic high schools in New Orleans. So I'll see y'all over there at the booth, because I know most of y'all got the Father Tony, Father Tony collection going, and so you got to get your copies. We also have a couple of things like iPhone and iPad cases, all kind of cool stuff. So come on and check us out, because everything that we do at that booth goes directly into ministry. Because I know some folk were asking your father, where does the money go? Do I ask you where your money go? You don't ask me where my money go. <laughs> but for those of you who want to know, it goes directly. Also, for those of you who are interested in finding out more about the film, you can go to fathertonyfilm.com. And the trailer is available now, as well as you can get additional information and how you can find out when the premieres are going to happen. And then, of course, you always can visit fathertony.com and see, see what's the latest happening with me. My brothers and sisters, I hope you realize just how blessed you are to be who you are. And realize that Jesus loved us so much that he would give us his mama as a pure gift to take care of us in time. So as I conclude, we ask God in a very real way to strengthen you in his love to help you to see through the example of Mary's commitment to Jesus how we are all called to be committed to the Lord and to realize each and every day what a blessing it is to be the disciples of our Savior. May God strengthen you in this love. May he help you to be who you called to be. And may you end up with a mama like mine that always knows that the whole world should know about her baby. So as we conclude, mama, I'm about to leave now. So I'll holler at you a little bit later on the phone, but thank you for being my mama and for blessing me with your love. Love you. My brothers and sisters, may Almighty God bless you through the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, and I'm out of here.